We'll move on to the Munster final. Limerick 123, Clare 122. Aaron Glam at 111, eight threes and one three from play. Tom Morrissey and David Reedy scored three apiece. Tony Kelly with six, two of those are frees. Mark Rogers with one two. Aidan McCarthy with four, three of those frees. Uh, Michael, we'll start off with you. What did you make of the game? Limerick have now achieved five in a row, first time since JBM led Cork in 1986 in what was his last ever Munster game. Uh, what did you make of Limerick? What did you make of Clare? What did you make of the game, Michael? First of all, a fa- fascinating contest. Absolutely brilliant game of holding from start to finish. Really enjoyed it. It ebbed and flowed. And uh, at the end of the day, I suppose uh, we spoke about finding a way to win. Limerick found that way to win again. And, you know, Clare had a lot of chances. And I know they'll point to a free they probably should have got at the end. But they had several chances before that, you know, to even uh, there was a stage when they when they were they looked as if they were hell bent to getting a goal when they could have popped two or three more points. And of course there was a miraculous save by, by Nicky Quaid as well. I haven't had anybody highlight that save, but that was an absolutely fantastic save from close range. And 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 the proof of the pudding and the save was how quickly the ball came off his holly up into the air. I mean the the, the ricochet off his holly and it was it was it was a really good shot, but Nicky Quaid got it got his holly to it and that was probably a game changing moment. But look, I really enjoyed the contest from start to finish. It was a fascinating game. And again, it, it probably came down to Limerick's composure. Even their goal, when you, when you look back in their goal, the ball was played in to Alan Galan. He took it round his man. Seamus Flanagan, what a very quiet game, it has to be said. He made a, he made a wonderful run across, uh, a kind of a DK run. And his man was in two minds. And then uh, Galan got the shot off and off the ground into the back of the net. And it was Limerick at their very best. You know, they, they find a way to get the ball to the man in the best position. And there's a lot of, a lot of made it the fact of the, the clear marker that the guy was on Galan. Uh, but having the, ball, the quality of the ball coming in was so good that I don't know could anybody defend it, and that's exactly what Clare do, or what Limerick do. They find a way to, to walk the ball into the channels, and then they pop the score, and and and, and they're so composed, and they never panic, and they never deviate, and they have a system that they absolutely trust. And why wouldn't they trust it? Because they won, as, as we found out, they won twelve finals doing that. You know, f- they won once to five years in a row now, and and then uh, four All Irelands and three league finals. So. That system is in place and it works for them, but the composure of Limerick versus the absolute tenacity of, of Clare. And if I was Clare, I'd be very disappointed to lose the match, but there's, there's, there's a big kick in this and who's to say these two teams won't meet later on in the championship. And if they do, I mean, Clare will, will, will be right there. Yeah, to be fair to Clare, I mean, the energy they put into this, uh, like incredible stuff and the way they got after Limerick, you'd have to credit them. In terms of composure, though, their shooting efficiency was 44% compared with Limerick's 62%. So 23 out of 52 compared with 24 out of 39. In a one-point game, that's just so decisive. And just to come back to the Keen Nolan and Aaron Galan thing, yes, absolutely, there was the ball going in meant it was an impossible job for Keen Nolan. But you could see after a while, he got the yellow card, the head dropped a little bit. You know, I feel tough on the, you know, Smith O'Brien's player. Like, it was a really tough day for him. But I would say Brian Lohan mismanaged the situation. Now, Michael, I'll come back to you because you in a minute because you obviously have managed at the highest level here. But you could like Brian Lohan got this badly, badly wrong, leaving it like this for so long. He had different options. Bring on Paul Flanagan, Shane Amori. He took off Aidan McCarthy, one of your key lads. He could have put him wing back and put David McInerney full back. There was options there, um, Nisha. And he kind of stayed looking at it way too long. Yeah, and and like he kind of he kind of had the record of doing this as well. Uh, even last year against Kenny, he was watching a couple of defenders far too long. I thought um, in the semi final. So yeah, and, and you would think, wouldn't you? Like as 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 a full back, you know, to play full back all his life, wouldn't you recognise like what was going to what was happening? You know, and you need to change something up, especially after a yellow card, because obviously he's going to be targeted then even worse than he already was being. And like, as far as and yeah, I just I agree with you totally. I totally agree with you there. Like he he kind of he probably got this one wrong, and you know Galan, like to be fair to Galan, it was brilliant that he got man the match yesterday because when they lost in the group game, it was probably his frees that were the difference. He missed a couple of frees, and then they lose by a point. Whereas then yesterday he's man of the match and they win by a point. So he was obviously going to be up, really up for this game once they're fine as well, obviously. And uh, but yeah, from a clear point of view. You'd, you'd have you'd have questions. You'd definitely have questions about some of the decisions there. Yeah, Michael, what are your thoughts on it? And look, you've walked the line. You know what it's like being a, in a manager in a you know stadium full of people. 
Yeah, I suppose you could say there was a case for maybe starting Shane and Murray or, or Paul Flanagan. There probably was a case for doing that. But having said that, even even with all that happening, it still came down to the chances they missed. And they missed a couple of frees as well. There was a couple of calls made. But at the end of the day, you know, I mean, everybody can judge it when the point is over. And, and everybody can, when, when, when the final well, whistle remember, has been... Everyone was screaming as the game was going on. He seemed to be the only person in the stadium and watching on TV that didn't think that this change had to be made. Like, it was a really bad error. From yeah, it seems, in fairness here, you'd have to question it, no question about that, but, but uh, he, he seems to be a man, he makes up his mind about something, he's he's not for changing, as, as, as Margaret Terzo once said, he's not for changing, and, and he, seemed to, he seemed to make a decision and he was going to go with it regardless of what happened, but certainly he did have consequences, there's no doubt about that, and I'd say, it'll be interesting when he looks back, when he and his management team look back at it. Will they, will they see it as an error? Because from the outside looking in, it certainly didn't seem to work. And and, and again, taking off the free taker, and there was other, a few other things happened during the course of the game as well. But even alone for all that, they still had chances to win the game. And on, and that comes from, and they didn't take those chances, and that comes from exper- the experience Limerick had. You never felt Limerick were going to lose the game. And they've been involved in a, in a, in a few tight games this year. When it comes down to the final stretch, when there's a point to you in the game, you always feel that Limerick have that composure. Clare don't have that, and you know, this, the rest of the championship is going to be huge for Clare now because beating two months to finals, both games they could have won, didn't perform in the knockout stages last year. So there's, there's a huge challenge for Clare ahead and a huge test. And they only have a couple of weeks to get ready. Yeah, and I think when, you, when you've been through those battles so many times that you don't get the white line fever. You kind of retain that composure. And that's something that we saw from Limerick again in this game. And they really are quite incredible at getting the job done when they're under highest of uh, pressure. And seeing their young lads do it too, Adam English, who of course lost his uncle Alex the day before, you know, very brave of him to go out and perform like he did. Peter Casey came off the bench, got the job done, Cahill O'Neill also. So all these players stepped up. So they were like those players who didn't seem to be used quite as much uh, at other times in the last year or so. And I'm thinking specifically the tip game when the likes of Adam English was left on the bench and Colin Coughlin who came on here. Like, Michael, they really did have to dig into their bench with no Sean Finn with no Keane Lynch. You know, they're, they're bringing in players that, you know, Graham Mulcahy starting again, Richie English is coming on again. They're really yeah. digging into the panel here, which is a great sign of what they have. And in fairness, they are, you're right, and Adam English, under 20 player this year, and Colin Cockley was playing last year, under 20. And, and and he's not afraid to do that, in fairness. John Kiley and his management team, and I like to use the word management team, because it's all about the group. They're not afraid to take off the big names. They're not afraid to take chances. They're not afraid to... to uh, to make big calls when it has to be made, and well, you know, even the course of this year's championship, Keane Lynch has been has been on and he has been taken off, and the road record has been taken off, and yeah, you know, and that, that probably comes from the experience of winning as well, and they're used to being in this situation. So, and and they're 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 blooding a few doors for us now too, and you know, the signs are ominous for the rest of the teams around the country. They're they're trending their panel, they're testing what they've got. They know exactly now they can throw these fellas into the heat of battle, and th- th- there's not much bigger games than a monster final. When it's in the melting pot, so he's coming along nicely, and 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 again, you know, it, it's 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 there's always somebody in Limerick will pop up and do the job for you. I mean, different yeah. players. Declan Hannon went off. Now that is a source of cuts I'm going forward. I think that's his third championship game coming off. He's an absolutely vital cog in that. And I think Shane, we spoke earlier on this year about the vital players on the Limerick team. I said about the goalkeeper, absolutely crucial. Declan Hannon was another guy because not only is he a captain and he's a leader. But he's also he's also seems to find a way to lock up that defence, and, and he, he's a very good communicator, and he's, he's well respected. And the, the other player we mentioned was Alan Galen earlier on this year as well, and they're absolutely crucial. But Limerick are finding new ways, f- finding new players, blooding new players, and it can all it can only be good for Limerick because you know they're they're already a very formidable side, and 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 there was a couple. I mean, to lose Sean Finn, we all wonder what happened with Sean Finn. And I still think they're lacking a bit in 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 the specialist Mark or cornerback. But having said that, they're getting by. They sure are. And uh, like, if you look at the two games, there was five minutes of injury time in the Leinster final, and Killian Buckley scores the goal seventy five minutes thirteen seconds. So the time had elapsed. And you look at the Munster final; there was four minutes, and there was over a minute played by the time that last puck out came out. And let's call a spade a spade here. There wasn't one but two cast iron frees that Clare should have had, which would have given them an opportunity to level it up, Nisha. You know, I, w- I wouldn't say the second one was a cast iron free because, in my opinion, he'd taken a lot more than four steps. All but right, the first, yeah. yeah, the first one was—I yeah. mean, how the first one was missed. Uh, I mean, it was a frontal charge. 
Uh, Peter Casey, it was an absolute frontal chair, there's no question about that, and that, that was a definite free, but look, I suppose, you know, that, that sometimes you need a rubber of green as well, you need a little bit of luck, and you need a bit of, but then again, uh, I'd always say, you make your own look, but when Clare look back on it, they certainly have a lot of regrets. Nisha? Yeah, and, and, and even, even, even before that, you remember Tony Kelly's point as well, and because uh, we were watching it in the press box, and it was like, he, the way he broke onto it, not, he had all the momentum going towards goal, and then he just tapped it over the bar, and for, I was kind of going, shit, Keep going, and somebody said, "Does Tony know what the score is?" Kind of thing, you know. It's like, God, but yeah, like, I, look, and I know people will always say, like, it's hard to referee matches and this and that and the other, but there's, there's just kind of there's too many big calls like that being missed lately. Um, just to, and that that one was as blatant, I thought, as blatant as you could have gotten, and the ref was right there. Uh, it was right up the front, like into the into his face, really as well, and uh, just right up the middle, bang, Polex on the ground. And everyone kind of stops and looks and the ball is on the ground. And then, no, it's play on. All right, come on. <laughs> and because remember before that, somebody had got William... O and even actually at the very end when, they f when the ref blew the whistle, William O'Donovan, uh, like I thought, fouled your man as well. He wrapped him up and took him to the ground and the ref blew the whistle and they all looked. And then next thing all of a sudden they realised, oh, that's the end of the game. It's the final whistle, not a free. So, I, I don't know. And you know another thing as well, Claire will have to deal with... Uh, Everybody seems to be fairly battered and bruised after you play Limerick, and it's very hard to physically recover from. It's like that thing that the, the San Francisco 49ers had that record in the NFL that any time anyone played them the following week, they lost all something like 12. They were like 0 and 12. And like Limerick seemed to have the same thing. It's like you play Limerick, you put everything into it, and then it's nearly impossible. If you don't win, it's nearly impossible to get ready within two weeks for the next game. So I think they, they, they could be under a bit of pressure against Dublin. That could, that could be shaped up to be a right game now. Yeah, if, if Liberty go on and win a four in a row from here, considering every single day teams are putting it up to them, putting everything on the line, it will be absolutely incredible. Um, mm. And they really are having to dig into the panel, as we're saying. Michael, in terms of Clare, do you think that they, they'll suffer the same hangover as they did last year, or the fact that it didn't go to extra time? And yes, it was heartbreaking, but maybe not quite as bad as last year. Do you think they can come back? They'll be playing the winners of Dublin and Carlo in the quarterfinal. Well, the next game now is the big test. If they were to win the next game, I think they'd be in a very good position. But, you know, Dublin, you can't take Dublin for granted. That game would poss possibly be in Crow Park. You can't take that for granted. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, he's, he's a shrewd operator. And Dublin have showed glimpses and flashes of what they can do. I always feel they mightn't have enough stick work to beat the big teams. And, you know, they're, they're, they're hurling. They're hurling might, mightn't just be up to that. But in, in a quarterfinal, they'll fancy their chances. And is there some damage, mental damage done to play up? We'll only know that when, 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 the whistle, when the ball is thrown in in the quarterfinal. And uh, that's, of course, assuming that Dublin come through. I mean, you can't take any team for granted in this championship. Because Dublin, you know, they might find uh, that, that game a bit of a struggle. You'd expect them to win it. But for, if Clare are to, are to come through the next game, they'll then be in the semi-final. I think then we'd probably see the very best of Clare. But I would be very worried and very wary about that next game. Yeah, and like with Dublin, it's it's more the lack of forwards than anything else. Well, myself and Nisha have obviously played in Dublin for a lot of years, and that that tends to hold the team back a little bit. But Nisha, a comment here from Column Lines Blind Spot saying, "Lads, please touch and hang to yellow. What are these umpires seeing or imagining? Desperately bad." Now, I I did think he got caught as he was going down. I think uh, Keen Nolan kind of with his side caught him on the head. I don't think it was intentional or anything, but you know, Hegarty did dump Hogan on the ground, who was obviously looking for it a little bit. And people think, oh, do you know, Hegarty's nearly getting targeted in the opposite way. Like, he puts in for it a lot himself. He's no angel. But um, I did think that it, it was probably his reputation preceding him a little bit there. 100% yeah, it was. Me. And the, the, the thing there, what I, what I really didn't like about it was that Nolan goes into him and then Hegarty flip, picks him up and flips him up, right? You see it all the time, right? but flips him up and picks him up and then starts throwing his hands out and looking for stuff as if, uh, oh, I'm just walking past and I got dumped on my head there by Hegarty. It's like, no, if you're putting in for it, you know, take back what you get. Don't be throwing your hands up and, and looking for someone to get booked and looking for him to get in trouble and this and that. that that's what I don't like. I've no problem with lads obviously engaging with each other and, and going at it a bit. Like, it's, it's a bit of crack and that's what you want. Like, your, your full back line and, your, and then your forward's not obviously backing down. But this whole thing of, of throwing hands in the air and going down and holding yourself down the ground. Like he got kind of flipped with an arm under his leg and he lay down the ground as if he had been clattered. And then his hands are out and he's, oh, you know, look, I, that's what I didn't like about it. Uh, it could have just been brushed aside, you know, and just said, 
look, the two lads were just at each other and leave it off. Like, I, I thought the yellow was a bit harsh for it. But, I mean, according to the rules as well, I suppose, you can't just grab somebody by the legs and flip them up to down either. <laughs> like, but, you know, it happens. Like, so. But I just thought, I didn't like the whole, I'm going to target them and then play it up as well. I, I, I just, I, I hate that part. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not something you'd associate with player, though, in fairness. They're, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be known for that or it wouldn't be in their game. But I thought it was a harsh book on myself. It seemed to me as if it was a, a sin of us to, to, to pay for sins in the past. And uh, I really thought it was a soft book. Because, and in fairness, if, if, if that had been allowed to play on, I mean, Limerick were in a real goal scoring opportunity again. So I think maybe the referee, with the benefit of hindsight, when he looked back on that, he'll say, I possibly should have let, left that go. Mm, and, oh, after the game, Brian Lowen said, we found it very hard to get freeze. We've always found it hard to get freeze. We just don't have the power and influence that other teams have. Michael, would you think that that's something that exists in the GA and is it something that's a problem for Clare? Is he right? Uh, I, I think maybe, uh, maybe it does to a, to a certain extent, but I didn't feel that yesterday. I mean, I thought, you know, I thought, I thought the referee as a girl was giving, there was, I think it was only, was something was only 25 frees in the entire game and uh, I didn't. I didn't think Clare were, were, were harshly done by in in, in in that aspect. I mean, go back to what I said a minute ago about the Limer, about that that last incident. If the if the play had been left goal, Limerick had a clear goal scoring chance. So I, I wouldn't. I didn't see it that way. Limerick had a couple. Of, but Limerick, or sorry, but Clare need to address is they had a couple of frees and missed them. And you know, if you're going to win at this level, you have to have a nine out of ten free taker. You watch T.J. Reid all day long. I know he missed a simple one enough yesterday, but T.J. Reid for the last fifteen years has put nearly, virtually 95% of frees over the bear. The great teams have really good free takers. And I think Limerick wouldn't be overly happy with, you know, they missed a couple of frees yesterday as well. And even the fact that Alan Gillan didn't take a free about 55 metres out, Jim Buns came up and took it from the other side and missed it as well. So free taking is such a huge part. But I honestly don't think that they have a case. Uh, we certainly yesterday as regards that. I don't think the referee got too many calls wrong as regards that yesterday. Did you ever feel as, as Watford manager that you didn't get calls that you might have got if you were, let's say, one of the traditional three, if we just put it that way? Well, every manager will feel, I mean, when his own team is playing, because the, the, the old the old uh, adage, bias, bias comes in, and we're all biased as against referees when our own team. I'm sure there was occasions we, we felt we could have got him or maybe should have got him, but overall, I can't remember any, any real blatant efforts by referees. You know, I think overall, referees are, are pretty honest, but... Uh, yesterday, going back to that call again, that free at the very end, the thing that amazed me about it was but they're all mic'd up now. You have you have linesmen, you have the assistant, you have the fourth official, you have umpires, they're all mic'd up. And for from to miss that, you know, at such a vital stage of the game, that's what I'd be more worried about. That that, that shouldn't be happening. And and Nisha said a while ago again, there's been some big calls missed. And uh, but overall, I have to say, you know, I think most referees are, are, are honest enough guys and and they make genuine mistakes, and we should allow for that too. But yesterday was, was in my opinion, a grievous error. Mm, yeah, and, 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 and to be fair, in the Leinster final, then Sean Stack, to be fair to him, like I, I thought, ref it perfectly. But then again, I suppose he was helped. There was no real controversial or no head high tackles or no, there was no real decisions to make. But like he just he refed it the way it should have been refed. You didn't even notice he was there most of the time. Like so. But Nisha, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quite agree with that. I, I mean, I, I thought there was a different standard of refereeing in both games. To me, the Leinster final, every, there was a lot of tip-tap freeze early on. I thought he blew things that didn't be blown. And maybe that's the kind of a guy he is. But then again, you know, the, the, the consistency is what's lacking in referees. Some fellas leave everything go and more fellas pull. Early on, there was a lot of soft freeze given in the Leinster final as well. But again, yeah, he had, he's, he's an honest guy, Sean Stack. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, and, that's a big thing. That, that's actually funny you say that the tip tappy ones they're the ones you're, that they always give in Dublin uh, yeah. in, in club hurling in Dublin and like you're just kind of even both teams sometimes would be looking up see what's going on and it's like oh it's a free in or it's a free out you know and then next thing you'd get away with kind of far more physical stuff and you'd be kind of going cheers like, you know I just got tripped or whatever but yeah. that, that is the way he refs it yeah 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 I'm just used okay. to it I suppose yeah. <laughs> Michael, um, just the Clare half forward line, and there was lots of great displays for Clare. Don't get me wrong, but for long spells they failed to get David Fitzgerald into the game. And by the way, Cotton Lowen I thought was excellent again. They couldn't really get Tony Kelly into the game for long spells, and he still scored four. But a lot of the game he wasn't really there. Aidan McCarthy was was rather quiet as well. What are, what do you think it is about this Limerick team? The way they managed to lock up the back line and don't have the you know the acre of space in front of the full forward line like. Poor old Claire did at the other end. 
What is it that they're doing that's allowing them to shut down half forward lines in this manner? Well, first of all, going back to going back to the way Clare lined out and Tony Kelly. I mean, Tony Kelly seemed to start the game too close, in my opinion, too close to the opposition goal. And I think against Tipperary again, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, did he win on top of of, of Carl Bell at the start of the game? And to me, Tony Kelly needs to be out the field. He needs to be on the ball. He needs to be in space. His best work is probably 50, 60, 70 yards from goal, floating left and right, because he's very hard to pin down. But Limerick have, have such a system in place that everybody, just, it's almost as if they do zone and mark that they are. You know, if somebody's out of position, somebody else covers them. If, if, if Dan, Dan McBurns goes forward, the wing, the, the wing forward comes back and covers them. They, that, that's, that's why they're, they're so successful. And that's why they're so good. And I suppose it comes down from games and years and minutes and hours of playing together. They know exactly what's happening. And I mean, Paul Kinner is, is rightly acclaimed as being an outstanding coach. And also Alan Cunningham as well, a guy I would have worked with a Munster a few years ago. So, you know, that, that system is a place and probably comes down to experience. And they know where the danger is. They sense danger. And they get fellas to, to cover off those channels and those avenues. I mean, yesterday's game, there was loads of space in front of the Clare full back line. Loads of space. I mean, Limerick have, uh, sorry, the Clare back line gone way up the field. Loads of space, ball came into Galen. That doesn't really happen with Limerick. They seem to be able to drop back. And of course, Declan Hannon is pivotal to the whole thing because he sits in that pocket. Now, John Conlon had a very good game again, but he wouldn't. He doesn't seem to have the same ability to cover and sense danger as, as Declan Hannon does. And I, I put it down to Limerick's experience and over the years, and they have a system in place. They trust the system. Everybody knows their role. And even when the young fellas coming on, they're, they're so well versed in what needs to be done. And, 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 and they find a way and, 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 and they trust themselves and, and, and their instinct. And, they're, and they can, if you ever watch them on the pitch as well, the players are really, you can hear them roar on one another. The communication seems to be very, very strong as well. And that probably comes with experience and winning. Mm. And Nisha, it's five in a row for uh, Limerick, which is obviously a brilliant achievement for them. But Clare have only won six monster titles ever, which is hard to credit really when you consider that you know, obviously they're a big hurling county. Six ever, haven't won it since 1998. So is there something in the psyche whereby, you know, it's just hard to get over the line in a monster for them? Uh, maybe, but I mean, they're, I mean, they're after getting beaten two years in a row by one of the probably best teams that's ever played Hurling, so they're not, they're not that far away. Like, this is the thing, it's like, you know, the idea is to be as competitive as you possibly can and try and get there as many times as you possibly can, but then, unfortunately, you might come up against this Limerick team. Like, if they were coming up against different teams or, say, like, let's say, ordinary teams, at the time, they could have been winning months or last two years in a row. Uh, so, I don't, I don't know. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a mentality thing because, again, like, look, they got them to extra time last year, lost by a point this year. It's just, you know, they had enough hurling done to win. It's just their conversion rate yesterday was awful. Like, it, it, it cannot, again, like Galway conceding four goals, you cannot have a conversion rate that low and expect to win a game. Uh, just they, they just missed too many chances. It's as simple as that. And... Mm. But I, I think that's what it comes down to. I don't think it's a mentality thing. I don't think so. Mm. And for Limerick, of course, it's important that they have that bit of time, much like Kilkenny, to get players right. And one of those um, before the semi final is Keane Lynch. Kylie said afterwards, Keane, in fairness, has done really well the last two, three weeks. His injuries have taken a lot longer for him to recover from than any of us might have expected. But he had two serious injuries back to back last year. All I know is that his trajectory is very much on the upward curve and we now have a fantastic opportunity with Keane to take him to the next level in the next three weeks. I'm sure you're going to see him in Croke Park in four weeks' time and by God, a hungrier player won't be in our pa on our panel in four weeks' time than Keane Lynch will be. Um, so, there's they're still the team to beat, Michael. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, just going back on Clare, the, uh, Nisha said they won six months of the finals and believe it or not, the first one they won, they actually got a walkover from Kerry. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> I think that was back about 80 and 90. That's a while ago. But uh, <laughs> I shouldn't be reminding Claire Hawk that because, you know, I had a huge respect for Claire Holding. But, yeah, look, Keane Lynch. But, the, you know, the biggest thing, even the greatest players of all time, if you lose your edge, you'll lose your confidence. And, uh, you know, the last couple of times uh, Keane Lynch came on, maybe his confidence was down. He suffered a couple of serious injuries. And to me, he's a magician. He was the best holder in the country when he got injured. But, and he, he's, he's tried to come back a few times since. But having him on board will be key because you're still an awful lot of holding left you played in this championship. And people saying Limerick this, Limerick that. Go back in last year's championship. Limerick won the, was it the final by? Was it, was it two points in the semi final by a point or, or vice versa? So there's never been much in it. And also, you know, sending off an injury, 
you know, a, a fluky goal. There's a, uh, there's a lot of things can happen, but I think John Kiley will be just really happy to get four weeks now and prepare and, and uh, fine tune. And in Crow Park, they'll be very difficult to beat in Crow Park because it's, it's you know it's, they're so familiar with playing in front of 60, 70, 80,000 people, and they'll know that if, if if the game is in the melting pot, they 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 they've won before in these circumstances. So I mean, they are the team that everybody will have to work hard to beat, but. I wouldn't contend this is a championship. It was over, and John Kiley is certainly far too shrewd a guy to let that happen.